Welcome to this um, special meeting of the Doctorate Board of the University of Amsterdam on the occasion of the PhD defense of Mr. Lee. Before soliciting um, the first opposition, I especially welcome uh, committee members who are not affiliated with this university, Professor Lee, Professor Berger, and Professor Grunwald. Uh, thank you so much for visiting us um, today to debate with the candidate. Esteemed candidate, uh, to open the discussion, uh, please read aloud the first part of the formula. Op gezag van de rector magnificus en het college van voor promoties aan deze universiteit zou ik in dit uur ter verkrijging van de graad van dokter mijn academisch proefschrift getiteld Base Factors for Research Workers in het openbaar verdedigen. Allen derhalve die mochten verlangen tegen de inhoud van dit proef proefschrift enige bedenkingen voor te dragen, verzoek ik dit te doen op een juiste en duidelijke wijze en al dus aanleiding te geven tot een geregelde gedachtenwisseling. The opposition will start with uh, Professor Lee, professor at the Department of Cognitive Sciences at the University of California at Irvine. Esteemed candidate, I wanted to ask you about trials. There's, there's nothing else I could ask you about given a thesis that advocates Bayesian methods for, for psychologists who analyze data and analyze models that in empirical science. Uh, the new thing that, that these psychologists would have to do in following your proposals is to think about priors. This is new to the Bayesian framework. And throughout your thesis, you, you suggest at least three different ways I could see that priors might be developed, sometimes by on, on statistical, the grounds of statistical properties, as in the Fisher information matrix, or in effect sizes with priors with desirable statistical properties. But sometimes through an innovative new method that you call yoking, where you relate, for example, Kendall's tail to correlation coefficients and suggest the development of priors in that way. But then in other places, uh, for example, in the replication studies, by the elicitation from experts as to what sorts of, or maybe it's the facial feedback hypothesis uh, section, the elicitation from experts as to what appropriate priors might be. So my question is I'd like you to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of these approaches for developing priors and which ones you would recommend for different circumstances for research workers who are going to adopt the Bayesian approach as you advocate. Uh, highly, uh, highly esteemed proponent, thank you for, for your question. Uh, so which priors to choose and if, if there is some kind of default I would say use the default priors. That's a kind of given in the sense that uh, these priors were developed by Harold Jeffries, and they were developed in the in the sense that you have to use them when there's not much knowledge in it, so there's no pre-knowledge there. And the problem with, uh, well, most of the time when you talk about Bayesian statistics, people talk about uh, prior beliefs, and it's very hard to characterize prior beliefs. So what you should use are base factors based on the statistical properties, uh, the first one you actually talked about. That would be a starting point for, for next stage, for instance, when you do a replication study. So you, you condition on the first set of data. So in that sense, it's informed. And then you also mentioned the yoking. The yoking is a, a technical uh, instrument to use because it's, it's a hard problem. So the, the problem in the Kendall's Tau uh, setting is that we ca cannot characterize the likelihood. So it's, it's a more technical trick than anything else. So it's not uh, uh, a method to find, to set priors. It's not a thing for, at least not for empirical researchers to do. So if I understand correctly, you're equating the yoking with, with the Fisher information type approach where these are both based on statistical properties in some sense, but the different approach would be the elicitation where you do try and get it richer prior knowledge. And I guess my, my follow-up question is, uh, one of the advantages of the Bayesian approach is that it makes genuine predictions about data, the combination of the prior and the likelihood. You now see what your scientific account predicts about the data you're about to collect or the behavioral observations you're about to make. Uh, and in a sense, the prior predictive distribution is, is the expectation of the scientist as to what the data will look like. That's going to look quite different, I think, under a default statistical prior or a prior elicited from a human expert. Um, what do you think of the merits of, of examining prior predictive distributions and what might they say about the merits of these two approaches in 
uh, let, let's take two cases, one where it's not a replication study and one where it is a replication study. Um, uh, highly esteemed uh, proponent, thank you for, opponent, thank you for, for the question. Uh, so, <coughs> You're talking about uh, prior predictive and uh, be eliciting a prior being part of the model. And uh, I think that's, that's an interesting idea. However, when we look at uh, so the simple cases of testing a normal distribution, uh, whether the, the mean of a normal distribution is zero or not, then it's, it's very hard to first characterize what is someone's prior, prior knowledge. That's the first problem that I've got with it. And second, or second of all, it's... Uh, it's not only one prior that you have to figure out, but also the prior of the normal model. So there's an alternative model and a normal. So this is in the setting of a base factor. That's a, that's a model comparison. And then when you do a model comparison, you have to, it's a type of calibration in that sense, because it's actually easier to find more evidence for a simpler model than for an alternative model. So in the Jeffries case, for instance, we use a Cauchy prior just to make sure that you actually have enough information or evidence for the alternative. Because if you do standard things such as a normal distribution, normal prior and a normal, normal prior, what happens is that the, you actually have bounded information for the alternative. And more likely than not, you get, uh, you get evidence for the null rather than the other way around. So uh, I agree that it's very intuitive to, to uh, explicitly model the, the prior information and have a prior predictive. But in the base factor setting, it's not always, it doesn't give you the thing you want all, most of, some of the times. Let me see whether I can find the limits of that. Thanks for turning the microphone on. Um, so in, in some parts of the thesis, you have informed hypotheses where now you do put a little more structure on the prior. You constrain, for example, an effect size to be positive. Um, one way of thinking about why that might be a good thing to do is that now the prior predictive looks more like the hypothesis that the research worker would like to test, that they expect it to go in this direction, and the prior predictive now comes from this resetting of the prior. I guess the question is, how well do you think prior predictive distributions uh, correspond to what research workers expect if they're based upon default statistic properties or weakly informative or non-informative priors? Do you, do you think research workers would be surprised with what the predictions of their statistical test are under these sorts of uh, methods for developing priors? Well, I, I think they will be a bit shocked to see what the prior predictors look like. I agree with that one, but it's, uh, so the base factor, uh, I really use it as a between model comparison and not so much a within model uh, setup where you the prior predictive makes sense in a within model setup. So you have only one model. This is my prior belief, and this is my prior predictive under that belief. That makes sense. But is it real? Does it really make sense? Because it's also the prior predictive not only has a mean, doesn't only have a variance, it has tails. There's so many properties that you that you capture with that you might accidentally capture them as well. And that's why I. The prior predict, it sounds interesting, but you don't have, uh, if you ask someone what's your prior, prior predictive, they don't give you a full distribution. They only give you some mean or a variance. So you over it. You might over it. Basically. Okay, so, so you see a danger in, in researchers having a good feeling about the mean, for example, but not about the variability of data around that mean, and there's a danger of, of, of overfitting a, a prior in that sense by having... Uh, a limited conception of what the data might look like as a basis for determining a prior? Yeah, that's exactly the problem. It's uh, the most of it, well, when it comes to base factors, it's the tail that really uh, dominates the behavior of this base factor. And people do not have much information about the tail. There are a lot of people on this committee, so thank you very much. The opposition will continue with uh, Professor Berger, uh, professor at the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University. Is it on? Yes. Um, you spend considerable time in, in the thesis discussing desiderata for procedures that do Bayesian hypothesis testing. Um, these desiderata go back 80 years to Jeffries, as you, as you, many of them, as you, as you show. Um, there's been something like, depending how you count them, six to 10 developed over the last 80 years. And quite intriguingly, you add an 11th in your thesis. Uh, called um, limit consistency. Uh, in, in the thesis, you apply this limit consistency to the Jeffries problem of 
testing equality of two Poisson means, uh, showing that his proposed procedure was not limit consistent and you then develop one that is. I'm just very curious to what extent do you think limit consist inconsistency is a problem with other Bayes factors that have been developed uh, in the world and how much do we have to worry about this and what should we do about it? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your, for your question. Uh, so limit consistency is something that we also saw for the two sample t-test. It's not written in the, in the chapter, but I did some experiments and it seems that uh, the development by uh, Jeff Rauder and also uh, Ruth Wetzel and uh, my supervisor EJ, they, um, it works there as well. So in that case, uh, it, that's one of the, I, I guess, mostly used in, in the psychology. But did you say that's a case where it's, it's it is consistent. consistent or inconsistent? It is consistent. It is consistent. Yeah, and there's another thing that I saw while working on this problem that was uh, due to, um, so in the Poisson case we had, uh, we also used the right half prior and that's also limit consistent and that I'm still not sure uh, whether it's related or not. So you can get a limit consistent base factor if you have a uh, right half prior on the nuisance parameter. It might relate to the work what you did with, uh, with Bayari and Annabelle and uh, uh, Garcia Donato. And I hope to cons consider uh, look into that a little bit more, but I haven't done that much work on it and I think that's a good next step to, to look at what's going on. Okay, so, so is your feeling that probably most things are limit consistent and it may be the exceptional one that's not? Uh, well, you have to work for it, I think, because there, there's this, there were a couple of tricks that we did there for the Poisson uh, case, and one of the tricks is just try to have some mean centering, or th that's actually the, the, the trick. So it's, it's, we, have, we added a shift to it, and on the natural parameters. I think that that's the, that's the, the, the mechanism that works well. And when we do a two-sample t-test, for instance, we also parameterize it in a grand mean setting. So we have a grand mean, and around that you're fine. So there's also a location shift there. I think that's the, the mechanism that drives it. Okay, thank you. And um, a second question, and a little, a little uh, uh, something that, w that wasn't really talked about in the thesis, but um, I'm just curious what you think. There have been, in, you follow the Jeffries approach of, of more or less having the prior distributions for hypothesis testing not depending on the sample size. Um, there are many people, um, for instance, um, uh, uh, Casella and Moreno uh, and others who recommended as the likelihood concentrates, the prior should concentrate also. Um, I'm just curious as to what your view of that is and why you would defend uh, not having the priors depend on the sample size. A highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. I'm, I don't really bother with, with priors being dependent on sample size, and the question is, uh, does it depend on sample size or not? If you look at the Young et al. paper, it seems that the, the prior is dependent on sample size because you have a mixture of G and there's some kind of sample size in your mixture. However, if you, so on the mean there is, but if you look at the effect size, standardized effect size, there's no, there's no dependency on the sample size. So you have to figure out some kind of parameterization and look into, so, so what do you mean by does it depend on the, on the, on the sample size? And one of the tricks also in, 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 I think that's also characteristic of Jeffries is to choose the parameterization in terms of effect size. So some, some unitless uh, quantity, and that's what I did for the Poisson as well. I think that's, uh, that's an important instrument for it, but I can't make it rigorous that that's the thing that really drives it. Okay. I hope that that ans answers your question. It does. Thank you, esteemed candidate. Thank you. The opposition will continue with uh, Professor Grunwald, Professor of Statistical Learning at the Mathematical Institute of Leiden University and head of the machine learning group at the Center for Mathematics and Computer Science in Amsterdam. Uh, <clears throat> esteemed candidates, I have read your thesis with pleasure and interest, but of course I also do have some questions. My first question <clears throat> is kind of a follow-up question to that of Professor Lee, um, because actually I recently encountered that sometimes there is some prior knowledge in the sense that, for example, within the psycholo psychology literature, 
we see that most affected, like 90% of affected effects of reported effect sizes are smaller than 0 0.9 uh, and larger than minus 0 0.3, something like that. So my question is, um, can Jeffrey's approach deal with this type of prior knowledge in some sense, or is there a logical extension which deals with it? Uh, highly esteemed uh, op opponent. Uh, the, so in the Jeffrey setting, in the formal Jeffrey setting, he, he just uses a default prior with a Cauchy prior round centered around zero. And uh, so what you want to do now is add some little bit of extra information to it, and I presume on the effect size. So one of the things that we figured out is that if you, so modulize out and you can have the, the likelihood purely in terms of the effect size, then we, you do the calculations and you come up with uh, those two hypergeometric functions. And now we can characterize what happens if you center around zero or you do not center around zero. Uh, there are, I think, two important tricks in, in so it's in chapter five, I think, informed t-test. So what we can do is now move the, the prior around what you just said. So for instance, around those boundaries, uh, 0 0.3 or 0 0.9. And you can do that with uh, a mixture of normals and you can choose whatever mixture you want. And one of the mixtures we use is a, is a inverse gamma mixture, and that mixture is, corresponds to a, a T distribution. And that's one way to do it. So you can center around other places, so for instance, between the point three and point nine that you suggested. Um, but now what if, if your prior knowledge becomes a little bit more complicated? For example, if you know that it is that your prior, so I agree in general, you cannot specify a, a complete form of it. But let's say you know it is bimodal, like you study all these psychology literature and you see, well, there's clearly a peak there and a peak there. Um, so can you also account for knowledge like that? Yeah, highly esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for the follow-up question. I'm, well, I, I do have the likelihood, so all I have to do is just add a prior to it. And the question now comes, comes down to, is this reasonable or not? And what are the statistical properties of it? And uh, it's not something that I uh, actually studied yet. So the bimodal prior, for instance. But I would say that that's, well, I would change my model in, in that sense. And then you, you would expect that there is a mixture going on, that some studies have a lower effect size and some other studies have a higher effect size. So in that sense, we can do it again, but because we have characterized the, the likelihood, but it's not within the setting, that the, at least not in Jeffrey's setting, a little bit more in the informed setting, and now we have to add that extra, the, the bimodal prior into it as well. It's, uh, it's possible, that's the, that's the point, and if it's possible, we now have to study the, the properties of it, so we have to study a little bit more, but it, it's not something that's impossible to do. Um, so if I may continue slightly more on this uh, question. Sure. Um, so that's interesting, but I, I think like the key word in what you have said is we can add this information. And so uh, the thing I am wondering about is if you follow Jeffrey's program and a general objective-based program, then you have these general desiderata, which for example say that by and large, at least in details, this prior should be Cauchy. And now a subjective Bayesian would just think until he came up with, or she came up with a fully fledged distribution and would ignore anything like Cauchy and those uh, that wouldn't matter, but I think within Jeffrey's uh, program, we, some, we somehow have to combine these ideas, like it should basically be a Cauchy, at least in the tales, with information that it's perhaps a mixture, it's bimodal. So now I'm asking you to basically speculate, do you see like, is there a generic way of combining this type of information, or combining a subjective and an objective prior, if you will? Mm. Well, highly esteemed, uh opponent, I, you, I have to study it to, to tell you what, if, whether I can combine it. I can, if you give me a prior, I can study it. That, that's, uh, that's what I can do. And I know also the device of where I have to study. So if you go back to Jeffrey's, there are a couple of desiderata. For instance, uh, information consistency is an important one, and there's also the one of uh, predictive matching. And because we have the, the full characterization of this likelihood, 
then we can, so the reduced likelihood, that's only dependent on, on effect size. So what we can do now is see, well, what if happens if you use a different prior, how does this violate information consistency? How does it violate predictive matching? And we, we can see that. And we can, all we have to do is actually study it. And uh, so for information consistency, all you have to do, so the likelihood depends on two hypergeometric functions. I know what happens if you insert one, then you see the, the moments popping up. So in, in a little bit more detail, if your prior has a certain type of moments or the number of moments, actually, I, I can decide, I can show you where it hits the information consistency property. Right, so based on this, consider, on this desiderata you, and, and the prior knowledge, you would kind of try to zoom in on a prior which satisfies everything you need. Is that a correct way to uh, so, so, summarize your idea? Uh, yes, and another way to summarize it is that you probably get hit, it costs something. If you add prior information, you lose something. So one of the Jeffrey's properties, and the question is which will you lose? And I know how to study that, but I don't, know, don't have an answer now. And one of the speculation is, so what's the driving mechanism? I think the driving mechanism for information consistency is, are the moments of your prior. Right. Predictive matching, no answers to that yet. Okay, is there still time or maybe a, I'd better? A quick question, perhaps. Okay, so a very quick question. Then I was just very briefly wondering about your treatment of Kendall's tau. I wonder if Jeff, so what are your thoughts on what Jeffries have approved of what you're doing there? Well, of course we can't ask him, but still. On the photos he seems like a nice guy, so. <laughs> I think he would very much approve, and he said, well, well if you look at his work, he's, he, he likes approximations as well. He says sometimes you have to be practical, <clears throat> even though his writing is not very, it doesn't look practical, but. I think he, he had the right intention in mind, so I think that he will approve. But you don't use the raw data, right? You use a statistic. Does he like that? I don't know the answer, but... I, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what he would... Well, uh, perhaps Jim knows, because you might have met him. But. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The opposition will con uh, continue with Professor van der Maas, a professor at the Psychological Methods Group, Department of Psychology at this university. Esteemed uh, candidate, I enjoyed uh, your dissertation. It's uh, informative, well-written, funny here and there, mysterious sometimes, take the cover alone, uh, provocative, and way too complicated as it should. Um, my first question uh, concerns uh, chapter seven, where you criticize uh, a paper by uh, Witte and uh, Zenker. Um, one of the reasons you criticize them is the power fallacy. You think Witte and uh, Zenker misinterpreted the term power. Uh, according to you, it's a pre-data concept, and they might have used this uh, in the wrong way. This uh, made me thinking uh, more about power and the Bayesian approach, and uh, actually, I'm not so sure what the equivalent in the Bayesian approach is of the concept of power. And um, it is indeed a pre-concept, a pre-data concept, but it is a very useful uh, concept uh, in, in designing experiments. And I could not think of a real Bayesian equivalent of this idea, which is important, of course, if you want to design or set up uh, experiments. So what are your thoughts about it? What, what is this equivalent, or how, how should we think about this concept in the Bayesian approach? Uh, highly esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for, for your nice words and uh, for your question. So, power in the, I've thought about this quite a lot, and power is something that if you reflect, make it more flexible, I would say that's the prior predictive or the posterior predictive, that's kind of the Bayesian way of thinking about power, but power also implies that you have a decision um, there. So, so power in the formal setting, in the frequentist setting, it has, relates to type two errors, and that requires a decision. And for the moment in my work, I hardly ever look into decision problems. I only look into uh, evidence quantification problems, so looking backwards rather than looking forward. In the, in the replication-based factor chapter, I kind of alluded to some way of looking forward, and that's using uh, all data and then uh, tr as, a, as a way of learning and looking forward. 
But in the formal power setting, I don't have an answer because uh, you have to give me a utility function and then I'll... But what then in practice would you suggest to when, uh, somebody sets up an experiment and wants to make decisions about the design, the number of subjects, these types of questions? You have no advice then or...? There, there, there is a device and that's uh, done by uh, Professor Gunwald and that relates to the, the Martingale. And so that, that device is... I think one of the, the, the assumptions is that you have a cutoff of a base factor of one in one way, so, so you need some kind of decision theoretical thing going on there. And uh, it, it's a little bit more flexible than that. And based on that, you can look into sampling plans or looking at uh, in a more frequent setting. Okay. So there is a way to do it, and that would be a next step. And I would like to go to my second question. The second question is, uh, again, concerns priors. Um, actually, I was uh, reading in chapter nine, and this is Lindley's adage, uh, today's posterior is um, um, tomorrow's prior. And of course, that's a, a very nice uh, statement, but actually it's also a kind of a promise of the Bayesian approach. If you have the real Bayesian uh, research program, then this, you will have the sequence of studies over years maybe, and then you update these priors all the time. And at some point, yeah, we are really sure about something. But thinking about this, I don't know any example where pe people really did this in this order or in this way that we update these, these priors. So do you know any examples in science where people really follow those programs? Uh, yeah, there was, uh, there was one, uh, at least one example by uh, Professor Wagenmakers, and uh, there was the problem of where the lonely people shower warmer, and they uh, redid the study, and they couldn't find any significant p-values, and they did it nine or ten times, and they wanted to quantify evidence for the null, and we used the replication-based factor for that, so we incorporate the, the the original data set as a prior for the for the second data set. So that's one example. And still a question why this not happens more, but let me ask a little bit different question. Uh, sometimes this research program is really a following up research more and more, and then you will update. Uh, but if this follow-up study is a replication study, I'm not completely sure whether you should update the prior or not. You say something about this in, um, what was it? One of your many chapters, chapter nine perhaps. Uh, but I'm not completely sure what you now suggest what to do with this adage of Lindley in case of replication studies. Highly esteemed opponent, could you? Yeah, so uh, do you update your prior or what do you do with the prior if it's a replication study? So, uh, so in chapter nine, I... I don't I, know, but it was chapter nine, actually. Okay. So it is... Maybe it was chapter uh, four. It was chapter four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was chapter four. The, the, the idea of, of so, so this, this, this updating, it is, I think it's very natural. I don't see what's, uh, what the problem is exactly. Uh, perhaps I don't understand the question. So if you do a, a series of experiments, and then uh, you use Lindley's uh, 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 adage, but if, if it's a uh, replication study, then do you still uh, follow this uh, uh, updating of the priors in this, or, or will you use the original prior in this case because it's replication study? No, I would definitely use the the, the replication based factor. So I use the prior, the, the posterior as a prior for the next study. So so what you get is the replication based factor it tells you what's the added evidence within the new data set given that I have the original data set, and it tells you a little bit about the direction of your replication. So it might be, if it's bigger than one, it says it goes in the same direction. If it's low, smaller than one, it actually, the total evidence goes down. And it, it's, it's, it's a very natural thing. And if you look at these uh, meta-analysis uh, models, the standard meta-analysis models with normal, normal, and FX size and normal, all these kind of things, they, if you look at it, they are basically a base up, Bayesian updating there. So it, it's already incorporated. Okay. But clear. I made it a little bit more explicit. No, no, it's clear to me. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will uh, continue with Dr. Waldorp, uh, Associate Professor at the Psychological Methods Group, Department of Psychology at this university. Esteemed candidate, I also uh, read your work with pleasure, and uh, I congratulate you on, your, on the breadth of your thesis and the depth as well. And of course, the, uh, the, the cover design 
which shows us the light in a, only, uh, with only a hint of dogma. <laughs> but I wanted to, um, to converse with you on chapter four, uh, where you introduce Kendall's tau and an approximation for its distribution in order to derive <laughs> the base vector. And um, the, uh, the, the trick that you, that you do is basically start from uh, a set of hypotheses, a null hypothesis and uh, an alternative, which is a Pittman alternative, which is uh, uh, arbitrarily close, dependent on the sample size, to the true value. And then in order to uh, perform the trick, uh, you let go of this uh, idea, the Pittman alternative, and uh, use a factor of square root n in order to get this statistic to be more like a normal distribution, which is, in this case, a natural thing to do. But I was wondering, in doing this trick, whether the representation of the hi original hypotheses that you had with the Pittman alternative was actually still there. My question is then, the distribution and the base factor, are they a good representation of the original hypotheses that you formed on page uh, 72 in 4.1.3 and 4.1.4? Oh, no, I have got it. It's on page 72. Yeah. yeah. Uh, esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for your question. And uh, yeah, so the Pittman efficiency or Pittman alternatives are used as a device to figure out, uh, to, de to distinguish uh, tests uh, asymptotically because they tests go to power, to, to, to power of one very quickly. So that, that's the kind of device that we use, that, that has been used. And, here it's not a, a technical tool to figure out which is the best test, but now here we just use as a as a local alternative. It is a, indeed it's a local alternative. So the normal distribution only works uh, locally in that sense. And the so when we just take the normal distribution, what we do, we just break this kind of the. the the true sampling distribution, we just replace it with the normal distribution. And the question is, can you do that, yes or not? So we did some simulation studies just to validate or look into it, is this okay or not? And one device that we use there are the copulas, and these copulas, they, they, it seems that it works well. And the problem is, if the true tau is far from zero, then the normal distribution doesn't work. But it's, uh, it's, not the, it's not normal anymore, it's not ontologically normal anymore, but it's a different normal distribution. So what changes is the, the variance, and what we have here is we bound that variance by what happens at zero, the tau is zero, and what ha so, in, so the effect is that the base factor we get is a little bit more conservative, so, it, so when you have a, a tau, a true tau that's 0.9, the base factor gives you 10 to the power of six, a million. In, in reality, it should be 100 million. But uh, I agree that there is a, a small error here, but the error goes into, well, we are conservative rather than uh, uh, positive. Uh, either way, that, uh, that's the, does that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, so as a follow-up, um, so you, you weren't interested, I, I, I can see that from, uh, from a base factor point of view, you weren't interested in testing uh, whether you can detect a difference, at an arbitrarily small difference between the true and an alternative. Uh, but I presume you are interested in these hypotheses uh, for themselves. Otherwise, you would not have used the uh, Pittman alternative, right? Dependent on sample size. Otherwise, you could just uh, pose one of the alternatives which is not uh, the same as the true one with some bias and just get rid of the uh, square root n altogether. And now it's, it's, it's there, it's arbitrarily close, and then you remove it again. Uh, esteemed opponent, thank you for the question. So the thing is that you're, what you suggest is really model the alternative, and we're in this non-parametric case in a setting, and I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to characterize the likelihood. I don't know how to do it exactly. And that makes it hard. And uh, there are devices to do that. So I think that Hufding did it with uh, use statistics. I think that's, that's the main tool there. And I, I try to study it. I haven't done it properly. But what, I, what we did see, and that's a follow-up on this, that chapter, is adding Kendall's tau into the variance as one way to do it. And so what you see that 
again, this, this kind of, the, the, what happens is that you, you can't do it fully, so you also have to do approximation to it. So it's actually one step, it's kind of like a tail approximation with an ex, extra term. And well, you can do, continue doing that. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Good. There's still time to... For a short question. Short. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very short question. Um, so you, you, you uh, applaud Jeffries, and, and uh, I do too, for, for his, a lot of his work, and you, you write down his convictions, <coughs> which, because you write them down, I presume you agree with them. And one of the convictions of uh, Jeffries is that uh, all inference is basically induction. I agree with that too. Um, and induction, <coughs> of course, is an interesting problem, uh, I think, uh, well described by Hume. Um, and, well, in essence, basically, it, it tells you that uh, if you assume that the world is, is, stays more or less the same, uh, then uh, such inferences uh, can be valid, or not completely valid in the logical sense, but they are reasonable. Um, and my question is then, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you see that the uh, Bayesian paradigm solves this issue of induction? Uh, uh, esteemed opponent. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, idea of induction, yeah, well, that uh, relates to this replication-based factor that you continuously learn. I think that's... Uh, is that an answer already, or <laughs> you want to hear more? <laughs> Almost. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's an important thing, I guess. And so you only care about that one. So induction being based on... on the induction conviction, or are you saying that the other uh, convictions are wrong, or you, that's the only good one? You could also see that the Bayesian paradigm, like the frequentist paradigm, or any uh, paradigm, evades the idea of induction by using a, a reasonable approach. Is, is, is that what you would, would agree with, or do you think? Yeah, I, I don't want to really criticize frequentist methods, and <laughs> that's uh, my problem, I guess. But. I think they are, they are useful, but not for learning. Frequent uh, techniques are great to evaluate the, uh, how well a procedure performs, but it's not a good way, at least not in a p-value way, to decide on whether something is correct, correct, uh, correct or wrong. And it's also always about the data, but it's never about giving the data what I've seen, know about. It's not, you can't go, go backwards. And that's my problem. And then, Doing Bayesian statistics might help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for the nice words about my supervisor being a frequentist. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> He's not a very good frequentist, to be honest, but. And, um, well, regarding this questionable research practice, uh, one of the other recommendations that we do is that we, you, should, you should not uh, do research focusing on the result, but you should do research focusing on the questions. So one of the things that in this, this, this chapter seven, when, uh, when I talk about four requirements of, uh, of um, what's the title? So I have some, um, some ideas of how research should go. So you have to pre-register some kind of hypothesis. So there are two ways of doing research. Sometimes you do confirmatory research, sometimes you do exploratory research. And uh, when you do confirmatory research, you should pre-register it. One of the studies we did, we pre-registered our hypotheses and sent it to a journal asking the journal, is this publishable or not? that focus on the question and not so much on the results. So my recommendation is focus on the question and slowly learn from your data afterwards, regardless of where you get. Well, it should be, the question should be central and the publication should not depend on whether it's a significant or not significant result. But so you're, you're I think we, we are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will continue this later. Um, esteemed candidate. The time for defending your thesis has expired, and I now invite you to read the second part of the formula. Na de verdediging van mijn proef van mijn proefschrift naar vermogen te hebben volbracht en in afwachting van het oordeel van de promotiecommissie, 
stel ik er prijs op mijn oprechte dank te betuigen in het bijzonder aan mijn hooggeschatte promotors, als ook aan hen die zo heuselijk hun bedenkingen hebben voorgedragen en aan u allen die deze plechtigheid met uw vertegenwoordigheid hebt willen vereren. De committee will now retire for deliberation. I will continue in Dutch. Um, meneer de dokter Anders, we hebben kennis genomen van het door u bewerkte proefschrift. We hebben de inhoud voortreffelijk bevonden. Op grond hiervan hebben wij besloten u het doctoraat te verlenen met cum laude. Um, de hoogleraar Wagenmakers is gemachtigd u op de gebruikelijke wijze met die waardigheid te bekleden. Volgaarne aanvaard ik de taak, mij door de rector Magnificus der Universiteit opgedragen. Uit kracht dan van de bevoegdheid, ons bij de wet toegekend, volgens het besluit van rector en college voor promoties van de Universiteit van Amsterdam, verklaar ik bij deze u, Alexander Lee, te bevorderen tot dokter en u alle rechten te verlenen, die door wet of gewoonte aan het doctoraat zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan zal u het diploma door rector en promotor ondertekend en met het grootzegel der universiteit bevestigd ter hand worden gesteld. <lacht> Nadat ik alzo de mij opgelegde taak heb volbracht, mag ik de eerste zijn die u als dokter begroet en met de zo loffelijk verkregen waardigheid geluk wenst. Beste Alexander, Dr. Lee, this laudatio will be in Dutch. As we go along, I will translate the relevant parts to English. Het is mij een genoegen om jouw laudatio uit te mogen spreken. Lang heb ik met jouw co-promotor Maarten Marsman gesoebat over wie deze eer ten deel zou vallen, maar uiteindelijk trok ik dan aan het langste eind. Eigenlijk hadden Maarten en ik deze laudatio tegelijkertijd voor moeten dragen, maar dat gaat nou eenmaal niet. Goed, wij hebben elkaar dus voor het eerst ontmoet tijdens je sollicitatiegesprek. Vaak neem ik mensen aan die ik al ken uit onze research master, want dan weet je wat voor vlees je in de kuip hebt. Maar dit keer zochten we iemand met een degelijke wiskundige achtergrond en daarom kwam jij in beeld. Op de sollicitatievraag kun je iets vertellen over je masterthese, antwoordde je, nou daar heb ik een presentatie over voorbereid. Tot onze verbazing opende je toen je laptop en heb je die presentatie ook daadwerkelijk gegeven. Uiteindelijk werd je de baan aangeboden en ik weet nog goed dat Dora Matske, destijds een van de leden van de sollicitatiecommissie en nu je paranymf, bijzonder van je gecharmeerd was. Je moet haar nog maar eens vragen wat ze toen zei. Je hebt tijdens je promotietraject enorm veel bereikt. Je hebt jezelf omgeschoold van wiskundige tot statisticus en ten dele misschien ook nog wel tot psycholoog. Je hebt abnormaal hard gewerkt en je hebt belangrijke artikelen geschreven en daarvan ook nog uitzonderlijk veel. We zijn nu samen auteur op 26 artikelen. Die artikelen zal ik hier niet één voor één gaan samenvatten, maar in het algemeen kan jouw werk ertoe leiden dat er beter onderzoek wordt gedaan, zoals de voorkant van je proefschrift als suggereert. 
Jouw werk raakt aan de kern van de wetenschapsbeoefening en combineert theoretische inzichten met praktische toepasbaarheid. Het is jammer dat hij het niet kan lezen, maar Harold Jeffries zou je van harte met dit werk feliciteren. Translation, Harold Jeffries would have loved Alexander's thesis. Toch komen je lovenswaardige werklust en je mooie publicaties voor mij niet op de eerste plaats. Voor mij is het belangrijkste dat je in het lab een voorbeeldfunctie hebt vervuld in termen van hoe je wetenschap bedrijft. Dat je iedereen die bij je om advies komt belangeloos helpt, hoe druk je het zelf ook mag hebben. En dat je de sociale cohesie in ons lab enorm hebt verhoogd. Nieuwe leden, vaak uit het buitenland, voelen zich bij ons snel thuis en daar speel jij een grote rol in. Translation, Alexander works hard, but is also an exceptionally nice person. Tijdens een laudatio hoor je niet te mopperen. Mijn promotor deed dat destijds wel, in deze kerk, toen hij mij onder de neus wreef dat ik toch wel erg eigenzinnig was. Voor mij kwam dit toen als een donderslag bij heldere hemel. Ik wist wel dat ik altijd gelijk had, maar eigenzinnig? Misschien had mijn promotor toch een punt en dat heb ik pas goed geleerd door de interactie met jou. Want jij, makker, bent minstens net zo eigenzinnig als ik. Om de toehoorders een idee te geven, een van Alexanders artikelen was net geaccepteerd en dit geaccepteerde artikel wilde Alexander als hoofdstuk opnemen in zijn proefschrift. Waar hij nog maar een week thuis voor had. Maar dan moest het natuurlijk nog wel even helemaal anders gestructureerd en herschreven worden, want zoals het was ging het natuurlijk niet. English translation, Alexander sometimes drove me mad. En als een onbeweegbaar object onderworpen wordt aan een niet te stoppen kracht, dan, dan is er gelukkig iemand zoals Maarten Marsman om een compromis te vinden. Alexander, je hebt hard voor je onderzoek, je bent ontzettend getalenteerd en je hebt je ontpopt tot de motor van het lab, zowel inhoudelijk als sociaal. In de loop der jaren ben je mij geleidelijk gaan vervangen als begeleider van nieuwe AIO's en studenten en dat stel ik erg op prijs. Ons softwareproject JASP is wat het is mede door jouw drive en jouw inzicht om de boel professioneler aan te pakken. Het was een voorrecht voor Maarten en voor mij om de afgelopen jaren met je samengewerkt te hebben. We hopen alle twee dat die samenwerking zich uit zal strekken tot in de verre toekomst. Er valt nog zoveel moois te doen. Ik heb gezegd. Waardeer de verkregen waardigheid als een eervolle onderscheiding, een gewichtig voorrecht... En vergeet dan ook nooit de verplichtingen die zij u oplegt, jegens de wetenschap en de samenleving. Ik kwijt mij van een aangename plicht. Zeer geleerde heer, door u ook namens het college van promoties van de Universiteit van Amsterdam met de verworven eer geluk te wensen. En hiermee verklaar ik deze plechtigheid geëindigd.